How many had a good day? Amen. Praise God. I had kind of a mediocre day, but that's all right. It's better than a bad day. Amen. Hallelujah. And uh, probably it's just because it's too hot. How many of you are going to enjoy complaining about the heat? Uh, that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> amen. Amen. Uh, if there are other classes, you can go ahead and, and uh, take those and go down. Um, for everybody else, why don't, don't y'all move up a little bit, Brother Brennan? Could you, um, could you hand these out? Sure. Yes, please. Amen. Amen. I'm, I'm excited. I'm excited by our Book of Revelation Bible study. How many have, have found that you've that this Bible study so far has changed your thoughts about how the book of Revelation should be read. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Very different than what we were told. Uh, all our lives, what do we get? Doom and gloom, doom and gloom, the Antichrist. Right? Mark of the beast, chopping heads. The woman riding the, the dragon. Right? All this crazy stuff. And what we're finding... In reality, is that God is talking to us, his people, and he's telling us that if you read this book, you will be blessed because you will see the future and you will know my power. You know, my wrath is real. And yet I will save you from all of this. And, you know, the Bible tell, uh, the Bible says that knowing the terror of God, amen, we know the mercy of God. And so this is what we have. So we're in chapter 9, folks. Go to verse 13. Or we're, we're at around 13. Um, and at this time, what we have seen is that uh, the Lord has released the four angels who were chained to the bottom of the river Euphrates. And they, they are beneath the earth under the river Euphrates. And these fallen angels have been given 13 months. Uh, they've been given 13 months to slay the remaining one third of the people of the earth. Now, we have to remember that the, uh, uh, that the population of the earth has been decreasing since the rapture. Brother Bernie, could you give him a... He's uh, right there. That's okay. The... The, the population of the earth has been decreasing since the rapture. Now, in the rapture, you had all the saints of God who have been buried. Of course, they were much of a population, right? Because they were buried beneath the earth or in the sea. But you had all those folks gone, right? And then you, um, But the people who were living on the earth who were following the Lord, they, they took off. Um, the population of the earth is decreasing because of the converts of the 144,000 witnesses. Remember, 12,000 of each tribe, they go out into the earth on the, in the first half of the tribulation. And they go and they evangelize the world. Many are converted. Most of the Hebrew nation is converted. And those are taken away at the same time. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9 says, A great multitude which no man could number. And these are all converts when? From after the, 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 um, the rapture of the church. Right? And so this is, this is really important. Speaking of the restoration of Jerusalem in the latter days, this is during the millennial kingdom. This is after the... Um, this is after the, the battle of Armageddon. Zechariah 8.23 says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts in those days, it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. So this time is, is a very tumultuous time. It's, it's a time of upheaval. Both militarily, spiritually, and uh, in, in, uh, in, in the governments of this earth. And don't forget, then the 144,000 are removed, right? So the effect of the fallen angels 
at this time is going to rapidly increase the depopulation of the earth. And we're going to see this. Uh, go to Revelation chapter 9 verse 16. It says, And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. And I heard the number of them. Well, what is that? That's 200 million, right? This is a gigantic army. Verse 17, And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and them that sat on them having breastplates of fire, meaning the color red, and of jason blue, and brimstone yellow, that's a yellow color, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lion. Now here's, here's that phrase, were as the, right? This tells you that this is a symbolic, this is a, that, that this, the thing being described is a symbolic thing, right? And, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. So what we've got here is basically military transport. Right? So we've got all of these soldiers, and they're all coming in military transport. Uh, remember that horses in that day were basically the, the troop carriers and tanks of, the, of their day. So they have, what they have here is, is what they're describing is a massive 200 million man army with all these horses coming through the east, coming through Asia. Look at verse 18. And by these three was the third part of men killed, by the fire, and by the smoke, and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. Now, some people speculate that this right here is a description of nuclear weapons, but we only have speculation here. We don't know, right? We don't know. And remember, speculation always speaks from a place of of a lack of knowledge. So we have to be very careful in our speculation. But it says that by these horses, by the what comes out of their mouth, uh, that people are killed by that fire and that smoke and the brimstone. Brimstone is sulfur, by the way. Same thing that came down in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 19. For their power is in their mouth. And in their tails, for their tails were like unto serpents, and had heads, and with them that they do hurt. So this appears to be some kind of rapid fire weapon, right? Because these heads can 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 hurt them. So the plague of two of a two hundred million man army can only come from one area, and that's the east. That's the east, because the antichrist. Excuse me. The Antichrist, he has battles in the north and the south. So with Egypt and Sudan, that area, he has battles with them. He has battles with the peoples of the north, people in Russia, people in Turkey. And Europe has been hollowed out by a lot of death, etc. And so the only place that this can come from is from the east. Can't come from Africa. Not right now anyway because there's a lack of unity due to tribalism. And uh, it can only be the East. So it's not just China, but it could be India, it could be Pakistan, it could be Indonesia, it could be any, any of those places. And over a 13 month period, he's, they are going to, this, to kill one third of the remaining population of the earth. So what's going on? Here's, the part, here's what's going on. There, this 200 million man army is on a collision course with the Antichrist, right? As they're going through the east, they're passing through the most densely populated parts of the earth. And we know that this is, we know from Daniel chapter uh, 11, it says, But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him, meaning the Antichrist. Therefore... Shall he go forth with great fury to destroy and to utterly make away many? So as I said, the Antichrist, he's going through all of these battles in, in the, from the kings of the north. And now all of a sudden he gets this report of trouble coming from the east. And it, it bothers him, right? Even though he's prevailing over the kings of the north and the kings of the south, it troubles him. Why? 
Because he has all kinds of trouble and he has had it from the beginning. You got to hear me on this. The Antichrist has had war in the camp in the first one third of the tribulation. Remember, the three fallen, the three uh, fallen horns or the three broken horns were those three nations that rebelled against the Antichrist. Right. So in the first half of the tribulation, he's got that going. Then he has outside trouble. In the second half of the tribulation from from this right here and then in the remember also in the first half of the tribulation he's got the hundred and forty four thousand prophets who are going out there and evangelizing people and he can't do anything about it remember the Word of God says that they have to mark the name of God on their forehead and he can't touch them. and so in the second half he's got all this trouble from the outside that's why he's not successful in his mission that he was given from Satan in Revelation 13, 7. He's not of God. God is opposing him. Amen. And this opposes a lot of theology that we've had from our past. Come on, somebody. Haven't, didn't you hear that the Antichrist was all powerful? Right? And, you know, we're going to be all tough and we're going to be... We're going to walk into the Antichrist and, and he's going to look at us and he's going to discern our spirit. He's going to shoot lasers out of his eyes and we're going to die. No, uh-uh. The he is not powerful. Our God is powerful. Amen. Hallelujah. And so we're going to find from Revelation 16 when we get there that the 200 million man army is destroyed on the last day of the tribulation. And it's only going to take one hour. It's going to take one hour. Now, remember, um, they had a year, a month, and a day, and an hour to destroy all that one-third of the, the earth. And since we know they'll be destroyed on the last day of tribulation, that means that they leave the east on the last month of the sixth year of, of, uh, of the tribulation. Okay? Now, what does it mean that this army is under satanic control and why and that it's going to oppose the Antichrist? It's because even Satan knows that the Antichrist won't be able to fulfill his mission. What he was told to do, what he was given the power to do, he cannot do it. Therefore, Satan's just going to go back to his old tactic and he's going to try and conquer. Him. What do you think war comes from? It comes from Satan. Amen. So this is not speculation. This is from the word of God. And that's why we, that's why at the beginning of the book, when it said reading this book is a blessing, it is. It's a blessing because it gives us knowledge. Now let's go to verse 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues. You know what? Does anybody have a question? Anybody have a question? Okay. Yes. No, we're, we haven't even gotten into the tribulation. We, there's going to be a rapture of the church. There's going to be a rapture of the church on the before the first day of the tribulation. Okay? So I'm still here, so you know the tribulation hasn't started. For you... <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. And the rest of the men, verse 20... And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the work of their hands, that they should not worship devils, and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone, and of wood, which, can, which neither can see nor hear nor walk, neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of, the, of their fornication, nor of their thefts. So even after the... The 200 million man army does its job, right? And you know the media and things like that are all going to be intact. All these things are going to be intact. And the media is going to be covering the whole thing. You would think that people would be running for cover. But it says here, no. It says they, they're going to dig down deeper. Think, yes, sir.
Well, it's going to be local and it's going to be. No, everybody's going to know about it. Everybody's going to know about it. But people are just going to get more deep in their sin. I mean, how, you know, we, we look at what's going on in our society now and we go, how can people not think about blah, 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 blah. Well, you know, if people a hundred years ago could see our society as it is now, well, not as it is now, but right before we got converted, right? And they would say, why didn't that guy, why didn't that gal, why didn't they convert 20 years before that, right? Because we sit in our soup that we make, right? And we sit there and boil away and boil away and we don't notice it. Until a catastrophe hits us, usually some kind of catastrophe, right? Some, or, or perhaps our, our parents have always brought us to church or what have you. And, but until we come to that point of need, we're not going to re-examine ourselves. We're going to live by exception. We're going to say, I had a good day today. I know I have a court date tomorrow, but I'm fine today, right? Um, I know I have a... Um, I know I have a doctor's appointment for that big gigantic tumor uh, two weeks from now, but I'm okay today, right? And it's until we hit that time where we feel that need that it's going to cause us to examine what we're going through. And these people right here, they're not examining it. Notice the four categories here. Um, these, these four categories of sin are, are spread out all over the, the tribulation, and they're they're going to get more intense as time goes on. Think about it. Murder. You think today is bad? You ain't seen nothing yet. Right? We thought everything was fine. And then the last two summers, what, we've had huge riots. We didn't think things could get that violent here. It's going to get worse. The, uh, there's sorceries. Sorceries. Look at the evidence. A lot, of, uh, a lot of Italy today practices some kind of witchcraft. Right? Astrology, horoscopes, shamanism. Right? If you ever see anybody uh, lighting sage smudges, have you seen those? Have you seen those? They'll, people nowadays, uh, you know, it's like the flavor of the month. But people nowadays, uh, they take this from the American Indian tradition, but they'll take a bundle of sage and they'll light it. And when it lights, it kind of burns like a, kind of burns like incense, and it's called a smudge because it kind of has this sooty, uh, sooty smoke that comes out, and of course it smells like sage, which means it smells good. But they do that, and they do all this blessing of a house and that kind of thing. It's pure demonism. If a house needs to be blessed, it needs to be blessed by Jesus Christ and His Holy Ghost. Amen. So all the people unconsciously just pick this stuff up. And the interesting thing is, oh, well, well let, me, let me just say this, that the value of life gets devalued when witchcraft prevails. A lot of witchcraft going on in the abortion industry. A ton of it. They're worshiping that blood. Uh, thefts, sexual immorality. Look, they're trying to groom kids into wanting that stuff. And it's just going to get worse at this time. And we'll get later into the book of Revelation. We'll find that those who don't repent of those things will have their part in the lake of fire. And that's the thing. We have to repent. If we don't repent, we'll find our part in the lake of fire. And these people right here, 921. They had their chance. They could have repented, but they didn't. And let me say a thing about sorceries. In, if you look in the other parts of the Bible where it uses the word sorceries, if you go down to the Greek and the Hebrew, those words mean like enchantments. But right here in Revelation chapter 9, verse 21, it uses for the word sorceries the word pharmacopoeia. Pharmacopoeia. What does that sound like? Medicine. Pharmacy, right? What it's talking about 
is that this is witchcraft involved with drugs. People say, oh, you know, a little bit of pot's no big deal. It's not a gateway drug and all that kind of it's, it's a gateway drug. It's a gateway drug. Why do people get high? To escape this, this world, right? That's why we drink, if we drank. It's to escape this world. And then people use drugs in order to get high. But God wants us, amen? He wants us, when we need that escape, that ability to see that there's an end to this and a future, we have to be filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what we need. And if you think about it, right? When you came to the Lord, you knew that you had an end and it was, it was not good. But when you got baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, what did you escape? You escaped that condemnation. And that's why the, the Bible says, don't lose your first love. Don't lose your first love. This word of God. Think about Prop 19 in, um, in right here in California. Prop 19. What was the point of Prop 19? It made, it made pot legal in this, in this state. And what's happening now? You know, it's kind of interesting. People, uh, you know, back in the 60s and the early 70s, the pot wasn't very strong. But now what they're doing is they're breeding pot plants that are so high in THC, the active ingredient, it takes you into another plant. Right? So it's getting worse, folks. Drugs and sorceries go hand in hand. And is there a reason for the body of Christ to get fired up about this? Amen, absolutely. We need to get fired up with the Holy Ghost. We need to be capable of handling the Word of God. We need to be at prayer meetings. I'm looking forward to the day when we have prayer meetings that go all night. And not the pastor saying, oh, you can't leave. Plank. No, but you don't want to leave. Why? Because you're going to be in the presence of God. We have to bring people to this place. Amen? Not the faithful dozen that come, but everybody. And guests coming and saying, my God, I've never felt this way before. Because there was a day when you and I came to church and we found God and we said, you know what? I never felt this way before. Amen? So we're the frontline forces that God's using to reach those who, who need salvation, who need to, uh, need to escape uh, in God. Amen. We've got to use, we've got to let God use us to tear down strongholds on people. To tell them you don't have to live that way anymore. You don't have to be in the grip of things. And knowledge of this word and the hope that this has. Think about that. Think about the hope that this gives us. That even in the end, God's going to take care of us. Amen. Because this isn't just somebody who's, who's a little, you know, kind of a little bit out of it. They've entered a demonic realm. So when, if you're going to speak to somebody on that level, let's be prayed up. Because we need the power of the Holy Ghost to subdue the demons that are dealing with them. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. 
Amen. Amen. That's exactly right, brother. Yes, Sister Jeanette. You had a question? chapter 10 let's go to chapter 10 so now like chapter 7 chapter 10 is an informational chapter it's the second informational chapter um, let's think about this uh, chapters 4 and 5 let's remember that those introduce what is us to what is taking place in heaven chapter 6 transitions us uh, to what's happened excuse me Chapter 4, 5, about what's happening in heaven. Chapter 6 transitions us to, to earth in the beginning of the tribulation. Chapter 7 is our first informational chapter uh, on what God was doing for man once the tribulation was underway. Chapters 8 and 9, um, chapter 8 picks up where chapter 6 leaves off and uh, continues on what's happening in the tribulation. Chapter 10 is informational. This is where we are now. And all the way through chapter 15, between chapters 10 and 15, those are informational. So what do they do? Those informational chapters enlarge what's going on either in heaven or in earth during the time of the tribulation. Okay? So let's go on with chapter 10. It says, And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head, and his face was, as it were, uh, the sun, and his feet as pillars of fire. Notice he's coming from heaven. And he had in his hand a little book open, and he set his right foot upon the sea and his left foot on the earth, and cried with a loud voice, as when a lion roars. When a lion roars, what's he doing? He's trying to get everybody's attention. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Amen. Seven, we had what? We had seven scrolls, we had seven trumpets, and now we have seven thunders. Now, notice that John knows what the, se what the seven thunders said. Watch this. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. Interesting. So, here's something John is told not to reveal. We don't know anything about the seven thunders. Biblically, it's not explainable. There's nothing in the Bible that tells us what, what this means. There's places, you know, John's, uh, somebody's, I, I forget, uh, these two brothers, these two disciples were called the sons of thunder, but it really doesn't explain to us what it's about. So we can't really speculate. But verse five, and the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein are. And the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which there are therein, that there should be time no longer. So that's not the end of time, but what he's saying is, is that there should be no more delay. 
In other words, don't increase the time that's between now and the end, uh, the end of the tribulation. So by this, notice what he's talking about, that all of this shows that there's, there, there's heaven, and there is a real heaven, there's real things in it, right? There's, he's, he, it, it talks about it right here. So verse seven, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin, means about, when he shall begin about to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared his servants the prophets. So, what is he saying here? What he's meaning to say is that all the unfulfilled prophecies that have been said about Jesus, about uh, time and all of that, everything, all the uh, all the unfulfilled prophecies of the tribulation will run their course. Now, when they're, they're fulfilled, then uh, the mystery of God as declared to his prophets will be revealed. What does that mean? A mystery is a, something that was hidden but is now open. Now we'll know what, the, what things are, right? Things that were prophesied before, what did they mean? Well, they'll, it'll all get explained now. So he's not saying that time is going to end, but he's saying that when the seventh trumpet sounds on the last uh, tribulation, that there should be no more delay. No more delay. Verse 8. And the voice which I heard from heaven spake unto me again and said, Go and take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel which standeth upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went up unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. Strange statement. Amen? Strange statement. Look at verse 10. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up, and it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. What is the little book? It's the word of God. It's the word of God that we have. Uh, Jeremiah 15, 16. What does it say there? It says, thy words were found and I did eat them. Thy words were found and I did eat them. Uh, John 6, 33 through 35. What did Jesus say? He said, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me will never hunger. So it's talking about the word of God. And, um, you know, the thing about the word of God is that, do you know that 85% of Americans never read the Bible? 85% of people never read the Bible. Amen. Hmm, interesting. Um, no wonder so many liberals have overtaken in churches. And that's why we're going through this, this, uh, this study right here. Because we want to do what's right. We want to do what's in the book. We want to believe what's in the book. And here's the thing. If we read what's in the book, if we apply what's in the book, we won't have the problems that we have. We will have revival. Why? Because this is going to be a center of knowledge, a center of knowing. It's going to be where God's spirit is. And when we eat that word, what is it? it it's, it's, it's sweet in our mouth. Why? Because when we first came to God, what happened? Whew. We were like, wow, my eyes are open. It's, it, it's like the, that battle that was in the forest. And, um, and, and David, he, he happened upon this, this hive. And he dipped his staff in it and ate it. And it, his eyes were opened. It's sweet in our mouth. But then the word of God demands that we change. And that's why it gets bitter in our belly. Because we take it in, we go, wait a minute, I got to change that? Oh no, I got to change the other thing? 
you, you know, I have to tell you, my wife has helped me so much because I've seen her when I've said, hey, this is what the word says. She goes, okay. And she just gets on and does it. And it's humbled me and made me say, oh man, you know, I, I, and so I don't complain anymore. I'll, I'll say, man, my flesh doesn't want to do that. Gotta be honest. Amen. But God says if you, it's, it's bitter in the belly, but that's all right. Amen. God is working on us. Our sanctification is being developed. Listen, just because I mess up today, I can go forward tomorrow. Amen. Amen, sister. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Verse 11. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. Now, here's an interesting thing. John was in his 90s when this was written. And there's nothing written in the Bible about him going anywhere else. So, it must be in the future that John is going to prophesy. Right? He's going to go before many peoples and nations and tongues. So, this is probably in the millennial kingdom. Amen. Let's go to chapter 11. Now, this is the ministry of the two witnesses. Who, who has heard about the, the two witnesses before in the book of Revelation? Amen. Okay. All right. Notice what it says. Now, here, here are the sounding of the, uh, of the seventh angelic trumpet. That's not sounded until the last day. But information um, is going to be given uh, for the details of that day right now. So watch. There was given to me a reed like unto a rod. So now he's by Holy Ghost. He's in a vision. He's seeing the future of heaven. And it says, and the angel stood saying, rise, measure the temple of God and the altar and that and them that worship therein. But the court, which is without, meaning outside the temple, leave out and measure it not. For it is given unto the Gentiles and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. So treading on the treading on the, the holy city means in the second half of the tribulation, the Gentiles are going to be treading on that on the temple, right? So this um, so this reveals that the Antichrist is moving his office from Europe over into Jerusalem. He's moving his headquarters from, from Europe over into Jerusalem. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Okay. That would make sense. Okay. Well, you were just looking a little funny, so I just wanted to make sure you, I didn't give you a question. So he's going to do that at mid-tribulation, right? Because that's when he begins to, to start the, the – uh, that's when he's going to bring up or, or announce himself as uh, God. Verse 3. I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and threescore days clothed in sackcloth. So what is this? This right, chapter 11 starts in Jerusalem. Here are the two witnesses, and this identifies the, the, the Antichrist as being a Gentile, right? There's nothing in, in, the, in the scriptures about the Antichrist being Jewish, right? Now, there is Daniel 11.37, which says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Right? But that doesn't mean that his fathers were Jewish. They could have been Christian. Right? He's just not going to regard the God of his fathers. Right? Um, since the outer court is going to be given to the Gentiles for 42 months, that's what? That's three and a half years, right? It... it it more accurately shows that he's going to be the gen a Gentile because he's going. To, that's where he's going to be. Now, notice that the two witnesses prophesy for what one thousand two hundred and sixty days. Thereabouts. What What does that mean? That means the whole of the second half of the tribulation. Those two witnesses are going to be right there prophesying, bugging the Antichrist. Amen. Isn't that interesting? Once again, you know, this guy's like, remember Bullwinkle? He's the, this guy, this Antichrist, he's more like Boris Badenov, you know, going curses, 
right? Every time he thinks he's got something going, God opposes him. And these two witnesses right there. Now, in Revelation 11, 4, it says this. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of earth. Now, the, these, these olive trees and these lampstands, you find those symbols used uh, in Zechariah 4 um, for Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua. Now, but that doesn't mean that these two witnesses are those two people. Um, but these two witnesses, uh, the, the, these have died, right? But and they're not coming back to life is what I'm trying to say. In other words, those two prophets, they're not coming back at that time, right? Hebrews 13 says it appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. So they can't come back. Olive trees are long lived, right? That's this is what they're they're talking about. You know, there's eight olive trees in the Garden of Gethsemane in Jerusalem that have been there for over two thousand years, and they're still producing oil. Isn't that interesting? Amen. Therefore, these are good representatives of, of men of God. When we live long, when we live productive lives. Um, in the, if you're in the ministry, right, there's no place for retirement. There's no place for retirement for pastors. It, even if you kind of step away from that office, you still got to be productive. And for all of us saints, for all of us, we have to be productive. We always have to be reaching out. We always have to be looking out. Remember, the Word of God says in Romans chapter 11, verse 29, it says, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Every one of us who's been called to God, and I, that means everybody in this room, God did not call you and go, ah, didn't work out. Right? He says, come on. He says, you are going to be useful. You are loved. I, if you repent, I will forgive that's what he says. That's what he needs. And let's move on to 11.5. And if any man will hurt them, fire proceedeth out of their mouth and devoureth their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. So these two witnesses, they have supernatural power against the agents of the Antichrist. Man, this is more exciting than any movie. Think about this. These agents, they... When they speak, if somebody comes against them, whoosh, fire is going to come out. That, that ought to send a message to people. 11 and 6, watch this. These, meaning the witnesses, have power to shut heaven, that it rain not in the days of their prophecy, and have powers over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. Now remember, we heard in, in uh, chapters 8 and 9, and remember chapters 8 and 9 is what's happening in, in the second half of the tribulation, right? Remember it said in there that there were going to be plagues, and these are the ones who control them. And it says as often as they will. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 4 says this. It's talking about the press conference of the Antichrist. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or all that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, notice, notice what, what's going on here. What's going on here is that these two witnesses are right there in Jerusalem. The Antichrist has set himself up as God. And remember, he, he has power. He has power. So people are fooled, right? It's like a threat. Do you ever get threatened in school? And the person made you kind of like look back like, ooh, right? It's a bluff. He does not have the power. Amen. Now, when he does that, the false prophet announces the mark of the beast and the worship of the image. We're going to get into some details later. Then the Antichrist announces that he's God. 
So those words hardly get out, and the two witnesses show up. Guess what happens? The world media sees the whole thing. Amen? And Jesus Christ is going to come back in 1,260 days. He's going to throw all of them in the lake of fire. Right? Now, at this point, the security agents are going to what? They're going to try and seize them. And when they try and seize them, what happens? The fire comes out. Krispy Kreme. All of it on camera. All of it for the world to see. And the whole world is going to be shocked that the, that, that the Antichrist can't handle it. Isn't that amazing? Once again, that guy who, who made you stand back, what happened? I'm not saying this happened in my life. But one of those guys, at some time, is going to come up against somebody who's bigger than him. And gives him a beating. And what happens? You go by and you go, I wasn't afraid of you. <laughs> right? Amen? We see them for what they are. That he's a bully. That's what he is. But our God, our God is perfect justice. And he's going to take care of them. The Antichrist has got a tough road ahead of them, folks. Amen. Verse 7. We're getting close to the end here. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. Hmm. Now look, the witnesses are going to die. And their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually is called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. So that's Jerusalem. But in that day, it's going to be known as Sodom and Egypt. And the Antichrist is going to bring his entourage of, of Sodomites, uh, of which he's chief, for, to where? He's going to bring them to Jerusalem, right? And this brings in the, the scripture from Daniel 11.37, which says this, of the Antichrist. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Wow. Revelation 11, 8, what we just read, confirms him as a Sodomite. Now, why Egypt? Um, because at the ceremony, they're going to worship the statue. And what was Egypt big on? Egypt was big on idolatry with statues. That's the Egyptian style. Now notice that the witnesses are dead in the street. So they're not permitted to protect themselves for the, for, for the full uh, 1260 days. It's only going to be 1256 that they can protect themselves. It says that they're going to be dead, right? It says... Their dead bodies shall lie in the street of the great city, which spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where our, also our Lord was crucified. Notice what it says here in verse 9. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three, and a half, three days and a half, and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. How is everybody going to see their dead bodies? Social media, TV. Isn't that funny? Ten, I still say TV. Um, because 10 years ago, we would have said what? TV, right? But I think that's an even better answer. It's going to be on social media. They're going to see it. Isn't that interesting? Now, 50, uh, uh, 60 years ago, 70 years ago, wouldn't have been possible. Wouldn't have been possible. Verse 10. And they that dwell upon the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwelt on the earth. What did they torment them with? The witnesses? They tormented them with the word of God. Right? They, they, they tormented. People don't want, when people are, are very against the things of God, the word of God torments them. Amen. Verse 11. And after three days and a half, the spirit, meaning the breath of life uh, from God, entered into them and they stood on their feet. And great fear 
and great. Uh, well, let me go back and help you. Look at verse 10 again in the middle of it. And it says, and shall send gifts to one another. These people on the earth are going to be giving each other's gifts like it was your birthday or it was like Christmas because they're celebrating the death of these two witnesses. Now, it sounds kind of incredible, but when you think about what happened during the riots over these last couple of years, people are excited to destroy. People are excited to hurt other people. And you know, we've got to be really careful, and I will tell you why. You know, some of what these Antifa people do, and these marchers, when they beat people up and they burn stuff, and they, it creates an anger in us, a righteous anger. And we should be angry. We should be. But guess what? If we don't bound it by God's justice, then what will happen? We'll feel the same way and fine, shoot them, kill them. We've got to be very careful because we can turn the same way. That same thing is in us. Am I saying you shouldn't protect yourself? Absolutely, you should protect yourself. But if we get caught up in their hatred, that bloodlust will come on us. Why? Because we're human. And this is, this is going to get bad, folks. What we need to see that's happened over the last few years should be a confirmation that this is in the very near future. Because people are unrepentant. I don't want to. I don't want to get. Um, I, I don't want to get a vaccine. Okay, well, you're you're so worthless. You should be thrown out of a job. Some people felt that way, and I heard a I heard a journalist say they are lucky we let them live, being people who don't get who don't get uh, the shot. Folks, I'm telling you, people are getting wacky. Amen. Did you have a question? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Amen. It, it, it'll creep up on us. Amen. So notice on verse 11 when I read it, it said uh, after three and a, three days and a half, the spirit of life. Uh, and God and uh, from God entered into them and they stood on their feet. Notice it's a resurrection right there on camera. Right? The party's over. Why? Because great fear upon, fell upon those who saw them. Verse 12. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. What an awesome scene! What an awesome scene. It, it's a resurrection. God calls them up out, uh, calls them out of heaven, and they get caught up. Two more verses, and we're done. And in, in the same hour, there was there a great earthquake. Remember, I said on the last day of tribulation, there's going to be an earthquake, right? And the tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand. And the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Amen. This is an awesome place to pause right now. We're going to find out about the seventh and final angelic trumpet. Notice people are starting. Amen. People are starting to cry out to God from the earth. Amen. Whew. Awesome stuff. Let's go ahead and, and stand to our feet. Does anybody have any questions? Amen. Steve, go ahead and stop this. Anybody have any questions? Any 